One chance, one life, one take. Little room for mistake. Who do you Welcome want to the Dead Funny, Dead Serious podcast. This is the 30 End of Life Doulas in 30 Days series. My name is Mitzi Weiland. I am your host today. And our end of life doula that we are speaking with is Janie Racco. All righty. So hello and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Janie is joining us from New Jersey and her business is called Farewell Doula. And we're going to just dive right in, Janie, into your why. Why did you come into this field? Oh, boy. So let's go back. (laughs) Um, Let's go way back to when I graduated college. So I grew up in a family of three. I'm the youngest. Uh, My dad was an accountant and I was his last prayer for being an accountant. My (laughs) older brother and sister veered off in another direction. And so my dad always said to me, oh, if you become an accountant, you'll always have a job and you'll always be able to support yourself. So lo and behold, I graduated from college with my accounting degree and off I go, pleasing my father and one of It was very big accounting firms. And after about a couple of months, I figured, I hate this job. (laughs) This is horrible. But I thought I had to stick with it. And so after a couple of years, um, my dad said, oh, why don't you switch to the tax department? So much more interesting. I switched to the tax department. Not that much more interesting, but better. (laughs) But within this time frame, I was in my 20s, I had a best friend who was actually killed. She was hit by a truck in New York City. And that sent me on a journey about death and dying. What's it all about? This was the first person in my life, other than a grandparent, that I was very close to who was my age who died. And so that sent me on uh, a journey reading every book I could find about death and dying. So it was always an interest. But I wasn't yet ready to give up the CPA license. I got married, had kids. And several years later, I live in New Jersey, outside New York City, 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people in my community were affected. And it was a wake-up call for me to say, what am I doing with my life? Life can be over in one second. And I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled. And why am I doing this work that I hate? And so right right around that time, I was reading a book about hospice, and it really spoke to me. And I told my husband, I am quitting my job, um, taking a leave, and I'm going to go. I want to be of service. I want to do something to give back. And I volunteered at a hospice, and that started me down this path of working with people who are dying. And that was about 15 years ago, maybe a little bit more. And I was just a friendly volunteer. And um, during those years, I would see my patients maybe once or twice a week. Several years later, where I was volunteering at this hospice, I heard about this end of life doula program. And I didn't know what that was. But at that time, um, Henry Fresco Weiss was the manager of social services at this particular hospice, and he trained several of us there to be end-of-life doulas. And it was very different than just being um, a hospice volunteer. It was much more intense. Uh, The training was different. And I started to do that work, and I fell in love and I just never looked back. That was it for me. That was that was what really made my heart sing at that time. Kind of rolling this all together, were you at, at the hospice doing the doula work? Were, was that kind yeah. of just a hand in hand at that time? So I was doing the doula work because at that time, um, Henry is the manager of social services. And so he was overlooking all the doulas. And that was the most amazing doula program because there were maybe 20 of us at one point trained and we would see patients when they were actively dying and we would all take shifts. There was one person that I think 13 doulas had seen this person and their family. And, you know, you'd think as a family, what do I want all these people in and out of my house for? I don't even know them. You know, my loved one is dying. But what they said was each doula brought a different gift, a different personality, a different perspective. And so they actually loved having all of us in and out 
and sharing the experience with them because we all brought something different to this time when their loved one was dying. So um, did I answer your question? That was a long story yes. getting back, but yes. yeah. So um, doing that work very specifically, I was very lucky to have a lot of doula cases in the beginning. I mean, that's just beautiful uh, as a way to start. It sounds like it just was this natural progression. And so now you're working there and we know that you know, some things have changed. What what was the progression from that space? Because I mean, that sounds wonderful. And, you know, why did you leave that or or did it end? So, so the progression from there, so this was still a long time ago uh, mm. that I was at this hospice learning this. In um, 2016, I think it was, Henry left this particular hospice and he and I had an opportunity, we got together to start our nonprofit, which is International End of Life Doula Association. There was another person involved at the time. Within about a year, she ended up leaving. So Henry and I created Inelda to go around the country and, tra- and the world, it turned out, training people how to be end of life doulas and going into hospitals and hospices and also giving them a program. So it was a huge uphill, I don't want to say battle, but um, we worked really hard to get this off the ground. And about a year into it, our other partner, Jerry Gladder, joined us. And so the three of us built Anelda up to be this um, really large training organization to train people how to do the work in in our view, how to do the work, how we had learned how to do it. I don't believe there's any one way. I believe many of us are inherently doulas if we're taking care of our mother, our father, our sister, our brother, our child, who's ever dying. We're just inherently doulas. But for people who wanted to learn the process, we were there to teach it. So we built that into a very, very large organization. Um, then COVID hit, uh, and we had a we had a pivot because we were out training people, and so we had to turn it into an online training. So we basically had to shut down and work at warp speed to get the trainings up and going on Zoom. We had other trainers with us. Um, we did that, and it ended up being amazing. You know, we were all afraid what's it going to be like training people on zoom, but it, it ended up working out. And in, I think around July of last year, I just decided, you know, I want to step back from training people. I had by that time trained hundreds and hundreds of people. I wanted to go back to doing <laughs> you. I wanted to go back to doing the work. And not that I ever stopped because I always volunteered, but I wanted to actually just take a break from the training and start to have clients and to also keep volunteering. Um, So that segued me leaving Anelda, Jerry Gladder, my other business partner left at the same time that I did. And um, it took us a while. I I knew I still wanted to do the work. It took Jerry a little bit longer to figure out, you know, she was a little burnt out. She needed a little bit of a rest And then about a month or two later, the two of us decided, let's incorporate and let's go back to doing this work. And so we started Farewell Doula, which is now our company where we do end of life services for people, anybody who needs it. Yeah. Yeah. Anelda is a huge uh, Huge. undertaking. Yeah. Um, and I've been transparent in some of these other podcasts and everywhere that I have taken the Anelda training. Uh, it's the only end of, end of life doula training I've taken. I, I didn't plan on being a doula even then. Uh, I'm a thanatologist and a marriage and family therapist. I just, I want uh, interdisciplinary work, I think is really important. And I, if I was going to be working side by side with end of life doulas, I wanted to know what they, they knew. And so I took that one because it was the most prevalent, you know, in your mm-hmm. training, I, I was in a class of, I don't know, 40, 50 people. Yeah. Um, and I know that you were also training uh, that weekend, uh, 
Henry was training somewhere else in the country, another yeah. 50. Right. And so I was just doing the math in my head at that time. Like, wow, there's a lot of people doing this work. I, I know. And it's still people don't know about it, uh, even yeah. though, you know, anyone that's in the field, they're like, oh, the Anelda training. Right. And right. And all these things. So you really made a name for Anelda over yeah. those years. You did a lot of work. Thank you. Yeah, we, we were lucky. We were we were doing it early. There were a lot of other other, you know, training organizations all wonderful. I have nothing. We just all had a different viewpoint of how we saw the training, but all fabulous. Thank you for sharing that. And I think that's what this series of podcasts have, has really highlighted. Who has taken what, what they learned from it, what they thought was valuable, because many people have taken three trainings, two ah. or three trainings. And I, I pretty much asked like, what part was the most useful? And for you, even being in the hospice, being trained Henry, at that time, right? And getting all that hands-on experience, it was kind of just lived experience versus yeah. the training, but everyone has different paths to get to this job. You don't need a training or anything else. And, right? We all have right. skills that we could build. <laughs> yeah. So. Yes. Completely true. And people used to, you know, I used to take all the phone calls at Analda and people would say, well, why should I come to your training organization? How are you different than anybody else? And I would say, honestly, I can't tell you how, how we're different because I've never taken anyone else's training. I can only tell you what we do. And mm -hmm. if that speaks to you, um, you should be researching, calling other places, talking to everybody. Um, but I, I don't, I truly don't think many people could go wrong learning whatever they can, whatever, whatever they can learn from, from this. And the best learning is hands-on, the best doing the work and doing the work. And I, I think that's where the collectives really have a space as well. Just like you said, there's 13 different duels. They all brought different pieces yeah. to that. All those different trainings also bring all these pieces, right. Yes. And whatever it, you're drawn to, right. You call all of the, the training facilities and you say, I'm drawn to this one. You're different yes. than your other people. And, yeah. and you as a person bring your own background, who you are. You can't not do that. I know um, Jerry and I have worked very closely over so many years. We trained together. We've been doulas together for clients. And she and I are so different. Um, you know, I am much more pragmatic, practical, to the point. Jerry is artistic. She loves ritual. Um, she's, you know, much more expansive and flowery than I am. So all good, but we are who we are and <laughs> bring beautiful things, however, you know, so yeah. I think, I think people should understand, just bring yourself to this work. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't say that even better. I took that training, I don't know, 2017-ish, 2018, and I met some people that I now consider friends mm -hmm. that are end of life doulas and some aren't and some are. And it is so interesting that they are so, so different. And I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish from that training, which was meeting the people that I would refer out to um, for my clients um, as a therapist. And I, they are all so different um, and they would be fine with me saying that because they are just, I mean, it is quite the range of, of folks right. and they're different for different people. Um, exactly. So. Exactly. As is each death is different and each each person, every family, every loved one, whoever you're with, you as a doula really have to tune in to who they are. You can't go in thinking, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, because that'll just all blow up in your face. Um, you have to just really step back and, you know, bring yourself to it and open yourself up to who is this person and how can I serve them? How can I serve them? It's not about us. It's about them. Yeah. Trauma informed <laughs> yes. end of life care and not projecting onto others. You know, yes. that's, that's the space that we're, we're in right now. So yeah. thank you so much for sharing those things. So we covered a little bit on challenges. We are recording this in April of 2021 as I've said in many of these podcasts, because we are just rounding corners from COVID, a very hard year for the world and end-of-life doulas and hospice care. Is there challenges that you're seeing that are now or overall for your for the practice? So 
you know, the biggest challenge during COVID was that we were sitting in our homes, not able to help anybody in person at all. All the hospices closed us out, you know, all of us volunteers didn't matter. Um, we couldn't get in to see anybody. We couldn't help anybody who was dying, whether they were dying of COVID or they were just dying a natural death. Obviously, yeah. um, loved ones couldn't get in to, to see anyone either. So yeah. that was really hard and really frustrating. Maybe the silver lining is that people started to think about death and dying a little bit more, have conversations. What do you want? What don't you want? Do you have your advanced directives in order? So... I'm hoping that opened up the conversations a little bit more. Um, one thing I, I am finding is that people are now much more interested in what I do. You know, five or six years ago, you would tell somebody and they would like just get depressed and say, oh, wow, you know, that must be so hard or aren't you so sad all the time? And I'd have to explain, no, it's actually the opposite. You know, you feel like you're really helping people. But now I've noticed a shift in that um, people are interested, like, wow, you know, my mom died recently and I I would have loved to have had a doula or what do you, what do, you do? Because I could have used that. Like, I'm just finding it maybe because I'm getting older. I don't know. I'm finding the conversations. People are much more interested about the end of life doula work than I think they used to be. So that's, that's hopeful challenges. You know, it's still hard for people to talk about death. It's still, still a difficult conversation to, to have with not so much the person who's dying, but their loved ones, you know, they, they just like um, my, my, partner Jerry uh, taught me this great, I think, um, visual analogy is that there's two, I always tell people there's two train tracks, right? We're going to fight, you're going to, you know, stay on that track to try to get better. And then there's that other one, what if? And so let's balance them both. Let's keep up, you know, if you're going to get better and do the chemo and take the meds and be hopeful. But what happens if if we're on that other track? Let's just plan for that. And so sometimes I find it's easier to open up people's conversations if if you can say, can we talk about the what if? Uh, yeah, a good analogy goes really far in this, yeah. in this business. <laughs> and what I found also hopeful, I had a friend who's actually, her husband was dying of melanoma. And she didn't really, she hardly told many people. Um, she did tell me and we would talk and um, she said, I can't, I can't go there with him with a conversation about what he wants or what, what's going on. And um, I said to her, she was talking to me about a conversation a doctor had with her. And she said, I can't, I can't even talk to him about it. And I said, well, what, what do you think he wouldn't want your husband and she said, well, he wouldn't want to be uh, on a ventilator. He wouldn't want to have, be resuscitated if he was dying. And she mentioned a whole list of things. And I said, tell your doctor that. Like, that's great information. And she's like, oh, yeah, I didn't think about it. So sometimes instead of saying, what do you want? Starting off with what don't you want? Or what do you think they don't want? can lead into, okay, well, you don't want this. Do you want that? Mm -hmm. And I found that an interesting way sometimes when we're challenged with people just shutting down instead of saying, what do you want at end of life? Oh, I don't really know. Well, do you want this? Do you want that? I don't know. To say, what wouldn't you want? Just tell me one or two things that you absolutely wouldn't want to happen. And yeah. who knows where it goes from there. Yeah. There's information on both sides, yes. right? If you don't say anything, it's also information, uh, but it's better if we have something to go from. Yes, yes. Ooh, yeah. So you said a little bit about, you know, the silver lining that people are, might be opening up to having this conversation. Um, I always have a little bit of fear. I hold a little bit of the fear that, you know, we go into denial a little bit, um, because we just want to bounce back kind of like a rubber band and be like, everything's normal again. Uh, but 
what would your hopes be for end of life doulas in general in the field? I my hopes would be that they would be a household word, that they would be commonplace, that people wouldn't say you're a what, or doctors wouldn't have any idea what that is, or hospices would either be hiring them or allowing them in a lot more easily. And, you know, we all work together. And so I'm really hoping that end of life doulas, death doulas, whatever they want to call them, are really part of, uh, of the team when someone is dying or terminal or has dementia, whatever, to really be part of that team. I think, I think we're getting there just by the sheer fact that we are training, so not, not an elder, but everybody is training and learning. So many people are now coming into this workforce, whether as a volunteer or working independently. So by the sheer numbers of everyone across the country learning about doulas, I, I do think that it's changing. I hope it is. Yeah, uh, you're in good company. I agree. I think the interdisciplinary piece and working together, uh, we can't all be in the same spot. Um, no. I like to talk about scope of practice, right? It's not in my scope uh, to be an end of life doula. It is in my scope to know what they do uh, yeah. because that's ethical on, on my side for any licensed professional. I think if we're working in end of life care, that this is so important. That's this podcast series, right, is spreading what what it is that end of life doulas do, and knowing that we can all work together. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred so. percent. And I lean on social workers all the time. You know, when I'm out of my depth with something, you know, I have people that I can call or refer to and say, you know, this is beyond me. I, you know, I know my limit here, and can you help them out? So we all need each other. And I think it's really important yeah. to recognize. I yeah. just love every bit of this uh, work. So I appreciate everything that you've done for the field and being here. And you're just always so lovely. So thank you. Thank you. So we're going to tell everyone where to find you. One, farewelldoula.com. All these are going to be in the show notes so you can uh, find it correctly because it's F-A-R-E, well, doula. So I just love that. It's kind of a plan words as well. Yeah. Um, and Janie Racco or at Janie Racco for Clubhouse. And I want to yes. push that one because Janie is rocking it over on Clubhouse and everyone mm. should follow her Thank and you. get notified because uh, all the rooms have been just so educational uh, for me. I just love being on stage with you. So thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Mitzi. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, so thank you, lovely listeners, uh, for listening to this series, like subscribe, shared, whatever, do one of those things, all those things. It tells us that this is important and we should make more of them. Thank you for doing one of those. And when you're done with that, hop on over to TikTok and Instagram and follow us there. And that way we can know more about you and uh, answer your questions and uh, continue this conversation on ethical end of life care because it's important. So uh, thanks. And we'll see you in the next episode.